everyone to the last talking track one. And we're very lucky to have Max Fielder from Slack. And he's going to be talking about CTFs and gamification because all of us in security are lucky enough to have access to CTFs, but why should we keep it to ourselves? So Max is going to talk about sharing with developers and some results he's seen internally. Take it away, Max. Thanks. So um, yeah, today I'm going to talk about uh, Capture the Flags. Uh, if you, you may or may not be doing things for your company or where you're working for Security Awareness Month, October slash Hacktober. Um, we are, so last year we ran a CTF. That's most of this talk. Uh, special surprise content is that we're currently doing a CTF again and more stuff for Hacktober. So not a ton of slides there because we don't have the aftermath because the capture the flag is currently ongoing. But I'm going to talk a little bit at the end about the lessons we learned and then how we actually applied them and how we're currently seeing things um, without necessarily being um, final information. So. I'm Max Feldman. I work at Slack on the product security team. I run the bug bounty. I do some feature reviews. I work on some reviews of our um, app, director, app directory applications. I sometimes go along with our developer relations team to talk about security or meet up with our partners about security. So I was here last year. If anyone came to the, uh, app, the OWASP meetup that we hosted at Slack, um, so that was last October, November. Like right before the Melbourne Cup. Um, so today I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about the SDL process that we use at Slack um, briefly, then security education in general, then capture the flags, then the planning, the flags, and the execution that we did uh, last year for our um, capture the flag, the lessons learned, and then how we've applied them this year, how we've executed differently, what we've changed, what we kept the same, and hopefully it will be useful for you as you work to make your own organizations a little bit more secure. So um, at Slack, we have a CI CD pipeline. It's pretty easy to push code, and we have about 100 deploys to production daily. So we have people who are coding on day one. They join the company. They can push uh, into production very quickly. It takes about 10 minutes. And new hires are pushing within that first week. So people are really hitting the ground running at Slack. We have an SDL process and an accompanying open source tool. Uh, it's not just open sourced anymore. It's open source, but uh, you're welcome to check that out. But it provides self-service checklists for security concerns and allows us transparent communication. So we keep our communication in Slack. We have a lot of open channels where people can talk about new features as they're being developed, as issues arise. Um, potentially as bugs are found by us, by our bug bounty, how we can fix them, what new features are on the horizon. And we have a culture of trusting our developers. So a lot of the work we do at Slack is to keep the trust with our developers, to not be a blocker, to not have an adversarial relationship, um, and to build trust between us, the product security team, and the larger security organization, and our developers, and other people in the company as well. Um, which brings me to security education. So developers aren't always security experts. Slideshows, walls of text, etc., can be informative but potentially boring. Books, classes, um, those can have a lot of information which can be overwhelming if it's your first foray into security. Different employees come from different backgrounds. Um, so sometimes there is a a lot of technical knowledge, but maybe not hacking skills there, or maybe not security skills. Um, and even if there's not technical knowledge, there's a lot of enthusiasm. So I'll talk about some of the ways we engage with non-technical employees as well. But there is a lot of enthusiasm in people for security. And what we want to do with our education is tap into that enthusiasm, engage people, and help them grow as not security professionals, but security aware people. And so we can have front end, we can have back end developers, we can have people in non-technical roles, sales, marketing, et cetera. Um, and with our education, we want to encourage intra-company networking and growing as a group as well. So not just having one group of front end people get better at security and level up while everyone else uh, feels stagnant. Um, so our goal is to kind of learn as a team, leverage everyone's unique skills so that we can get better together. Um, as far as security education goes, 
Security training and classes can be expensive or overkill. You could spend thousands and thousands of dollars on training at Black Hat, and maybe that's just too far beyond someone's skill level. So they go in expecting to learn something, and they come out overwhelmed. Um, security conferences may not be relevant enough. They can also be full of degenerates. Um, so the big question is, can we improve our education techniques? And the answer is yes. So that brings us to CTFs. So who's uh, participated in a CTF before? Nice. So it's pretty popular, pretty common in the security industry. So a bit of history. They were kind of started and formalized at DEF CON 4. They've since grown in popularity. There's now more formalization, more automation involved. Um, so over time, the challenges have kind of adapted to help people work and they've improved. Um, it's a pretty common puzzle in the security industry. We see it in a lot of contexts. It's often just fun at various conferences. You'll have these. Sometimes companies will run them. Sometimes companies will run them as a recruiting method. Sometimes Black Hat, I've seen CTFs that like a company at Black Hat ran to get people invited to their Black Hat party. So it was a selection mode for getting people to show up and then drink and eat for free. Um, there's almost never a weekend without a CTF, and there are two main types. You've got your Jeopardy style, and you have kind of attack and defense, where you attack things or you defend them, and sometimes both. So uh, DEF CON 4 was the first formal CTF. Contestants were uh, uh, provided with um, resources, and so you had to kind of hack each other, and then points were judged after the fact. Um, now they're more commonly organized by various groups, often uh, winning CTF teams. You see them at DEF CON, Black Hat, um, AppSec conferences. You have SANS NetWars, CTFs as a training. You have other companies that are using CTFs as a training. Uh, more recent CTFs that we felt were noteworthy were um, DEF CON 24, the Cyber Grand Challenge. So this was the first fully automated machine learning CTF. Um, DEF CON 25 had clemency, which was a middle endian nine byte nine bit byte length machine. Um, it was announced 24 hours ahead of the challenge, but by the time it started, teams still had tooling in place to solve this. So the people participating in these are also an extremely high caliber of security professional and reverse engineers and things like this. So you get um, CTFs at conferences can be a little tailored to security professionals. They, they are. It's a conference for security professionals, so the challenges are tailored to them. So that brings us to the pros and cons of CTFs. Pros, you've got great puzzles. They're often neat rewards and incentives. Uh, they're great memes um, for everyone who's interested in memes. You have a lot of custom, uh, well, not a lot. You have a couple custom platforms that have popped up. So you have CTFD and Facebook CTF are pretty big. Um, the cons, maybe they're not work appropriate. Blaze CTF <laughs> was the weed capture the flag, um, which if you're in Canada, that's fine, or certain states. Um, but they can, and then another con is they're tailored to a different level of security skill. So if you take someone who has no technical background from your company and you say, hey, take a crack at the DEF CON CTF, they likely would not know where to start. And so we decided that a CTF could work for us if we keep a few goals in mind. So we wanted to raise security awareness and skills throughout the company, throughout um, everyone's backgrounds and areas of employment. So we wanted to engage a broad audience. Uh, most of our employees are not hackers. We have the security team, which is a small group of people in a thousand person company. So we have hundreds and hundreds of people who are not hackers, who are not security professionals. <laughs> And we want to engage them and make sure that they're both having fun but also learning and making Slack more secure as we go. Um, and we also wanted to measure our impact. Um, it's cool to host a CTF. It's cool to throw together a bunch of puzzles and challenge people. But it's important to say, yes, this was successful, or no, this wasn't successful, or yes, we provided value, or yes, it's, it's good that you gave us this uh, money to buy these prizes. We didn't just screw around with it and buy ourselves nice, ourselves nice things. So we have front end devs, back end devs, ops, IT, non-technical staff, so CE marketing facilities. Uh, we wanted everyone to be able to participate to a degree. So we started planning for this in August of last year. This year, we started planning a little bit before August, but I'll get to that in a bit. 
Um, so we spoke with our internal events and communication departments. We organized live lock picking villages. We had a themed happy hour for Security Awareness Month. Um, to be honest, our, our Security Awareness Month was mostly focused on the CTF. We had some stickers made, we had some other activities, but most of our resources went into the CTF and making sure that it was engaging for people. So we kept Slack channels open for people to discuss the CTF, to form teams, to ask us questions, to look for hints to, to chat with each other, to get better at it, um, and we kept things pretty open and transparent. We had security office hours, we hosted some additional sessions. Um, we also wanted to avoid disrupting our company and like bankrupting us because everyone stopped working on features and started working on the CTF. Um, very real threat if your CTF is enjoyable, you can hurt your business. We did not. So we sandbox or we time box this to a week and we also offered prizes. So we wanted people to not only have a feeling of accomplishment, but also get something a little more tangible. Um, and I'll talk about those a bit later. So in our planning uh, phase, we worked within the security team and a couple people from Workplace uh, to organize the content and to think about the content and to be mindful of how we can reach a broad audience. So it's easy to throw together web app challenges when you're the product security team. It's easy to say, okay, let's put some XSS challenges together. Or let's put together some like padding Oracle attacks for crypto. Um, those are fun, but those don't reach your marketing team, your sales team, or potentially even um, developers or people with a technical background. Not everyone dabbles in crypto for fun. So we started with security trivia, um, a lot of things that could be Googled, but maybe you wouldn't be familiar with. Um, then we had the ProdSec team work on web app stuff. We also picked up crypto. We have an incident response team, and they uh, put together a forensics challenge. We did some OSINT stuff, so put things out there in the internet so that people could Google. And that's, if you don't think about that, if you're, if you're not uh, operating with an attacker mindset, it can be pretty kind of an epiphany to realize, oh, there is secret information out there that you can find just by Googling, or this is how much information is available about a person online. We also threw in some um, company-specific challenges. So we hit some flags within Slack to reward knowledge of the product. And this is generalizable to a degree, depending on what you work on. But it's cool to hack an intentionally vulnerable web application. It's a business use case to encourage people to explore what you work on more by hiding flags there. So we chose Facebook CTF as the um, CTF infrastructure because it was prettier. We got the fidget spinning dot life domain. Fidget spinners were more popular at the time. Um, they're still popular to a degree, debatably, but uh, John, my colleague, thinks they're not. Uh, they were at the time. It was very relevant. And we also had a spreadsheet offering an accessible version of these challenges. So um, with a big enough company, you want to be mindful of people who have um, like impaired vision or other accessibility issues, and it's not super hard to copy and paste some text into a spreadsheet that's very easy to be read by a screen reader or whatever else. Uh, we use DigitalOcean to host our stuff, and then we use Slack for collaboration. Slack is where CTFs happen. Um, this is a play on our slogan, uh, where work happens, if you haven't seen that, so it, it is funny. Um, so let's get to the flags. Um, so when we were thinking about making the flags, we wanted to make them meme based, uh, have like millennial appeal, so avocado toast, or I guess here it's smashed avo, um, heavy integration of puns. Um, we split up the work between the security teams. There are a lot of people who have specialties and you want to let them flourish when they're making their own puzzles. And we collaborated among everyone in the security team on the miscellaneous challenges and the trivia. So um, I'm going to go through a couple of examples of the challenges we put together. So If You Want to Cry My Lover was about the CFAA, which is the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which is what Marcus Hutchins' um, malware tech was prosecuted under. Um, All Your Base Are Belong to Us was talking about encoding um, in a .pem certificate file, and this is Base64. So this starts to expose people to things that maybe they haven't heard of before. So maybe you hadn't heard of WannaCry or malware or the CFAA, or you hadn't heard of Base64 encoding, but even if you hadn't heard of them, you could, you could Google this. So you could Google 
Marcus Hutchins' name and indictment, and this would come up. Um, for some of the OSINT and Slack-specific challenges, these were also meant to be accessible to anyone regardless of uh, technical level. So one of them was do it for the gram. I made an Instagram and put a flag in it. And that was, you just had to Google for, uh, well, so it was tagged at the Slack HQ location and the hint was uh, someone posted a flag to social media. We think they were hanging out at headquarters. So you could Google and sleuth a little bit and you could get to that point. Um, cryptography, we had, it's all Latin to me. This was a simple ROT13 um, challenge. So you could, you could also get this with the internet without actually having to understand ROT13, you could Google it. Um, hash me outside, how about that, uh, was to also topical at the time. Uh, this was a, uh, an example of hash cracking and showing how insecure MD5 is. Um, there were a couple MD5 hashes and you ran them in hash killer or you could run Hashcat yourself if you wanted, but I don't think anyone did that, and you get a flag. So these were, despite being crypto challenges, they were intro, but at an intro level where you don't really need to have technical experience to do it. You could use just Google, just your browser, and you could solve these challenges. So for forensics, our incident response team put together a PCAP with an attack scenario of a malicious insider who's stealing some information, who's sending it off to Russia. Um, and so it covered Wireshark basics, some traffic analysis, unzipping files from keycaps, some OSINT as well, Word document properties, EXIFs, which is also pretty interesting if, you, um, if you're not familiar with the metadata, with the, the hidden data that can be contained in a JPEG or in other files or other documents, this can be pretty... Uh, Maybe not mind blowing, but uh, it can make you think a little bit, like what information is actually there? What do you picture store? So if you're a non-technical person or if you're not thinking with a security mindset, you can see, oh, there might be some danger in even just basic things like uploading a photo online. Um, so yeah, we also, it's if you've completed a CTF or if you've done a CTF that has more, has forensic challenges, a lot of those are more, reverse engineering or digging through, I, like, I've done one where it was a, it was like, it was a PCAP, or you used Wireshark, but it was, um, the data format was transferred with like the, whatever protocol ODB2 for like automobiles uses. So you're kind of really digging and you're, and you're familiarizing yourself with maybe unfamiliar formats. We wanted this to be easier. So this forensic challenge was intentionally easier than a CTF you would see at a conference. Um, web app, this is, we didn't go crazy here, but this, this was a lot of the challenges where a web application and ProdSec is a web application security team. So we were pretty enthused about this. We had a range of web application flags ranging from HTML comments to PHP deserialization vulnerabilities. We covered many of the OWASP top 10. We had XSS, including exploitation. So the flag wasn't to find it the fl or to just say, hey, we found XSS. You got the flag by using a payload that would send a cookie off to a server that you had to create. So, which we did include a lot of hints for because the, the, we wanted the tricky thing there to be the JavaScript execution and not the like build your own server. So we said, hey, check out request bin. Here are some examples. We had SQL injection, we had RCE, um, PHP deserialization, as I said. And so that was all the planning phase. These were the things we put together ahead of time. And then um, October came and we said, okay, time to go. So we did company-wide announcements and prepped with our internal events team, with our internal comms team and said, hey, the CTF is coming, it's Security Awareness Month. We actually did an early launch for the Melbourne office because of the time zone difference. So Slack is headquartered in San Francisco. Um, I, on Sunday afternoon or night, launched the CTF so that people in Melbourne on Monday morning could start it and that everyone could have the full week. Um, and so by the end of the day, one team of five had most of the challenges. And other people were catching up. So very quickly, people were diving into it. Um, some people got started on like Tuesday or Wednesday instead, but on the first day, people were getting pretty involved. 
Um, we actually ran out of challenges for a couple of our stronger teams. Uh, one of our folks on the ops team used to be a hacker, so he's very well versed in that. Also our CTO and co-founder, uh, he was one of the people who got all of the challenges. Um, so we had to make slash borrow some more. We stole some from PPP. We stole some from other places. We made some of our own, um, did some random like, uh, one of them was encoding a flag as text that you would see if you looked at like a spectrograph of an audio file, um, which wasn't terribly hard. You could you could find a program to do this for you, but um, it was it starts to get pretty out there. From so we started to like, during the week scramble to make the range of difficulty much broader because at first it started. For the, for the most part, it was appropriate, but there were a couple people who were crushing it, so we, we wanted them to stay engaged as well. So what worked? Um, people participated globally across diverse departments. Um, we encouraged people to form teams. We had some of our satellite offices, are, so Melbourne, for example, or, or Dublin, London, those are smaller, and the, but because they're a smaller office, people are a little tighter socially, and so they had a lot of teams forming across different uh, different backgrounds or different different professional teams, they would make their own CTF team. So we also um, had more interactions with the company. We put ourselves out there as the security team and we were fun and cool and you can talk to us and stuff. Um, and we put our faces out there. It's the most, um, the most that I personally have interacted with our CTO uh, was during the CTF because he would swing by my desk or he would DM me about uh, things he was working on or sometimes things would break and he would notice very quickly. Um, so, so that was kind of a win for our team. It was uh, We were surfacing ourselves higher up, but we also got to meet and talk with a lot more people in the company. Um, as I said, teams were formed. Uh, teamwork makes the dream possible. So it was great to see a lot of people on teams. We had about... Uh, Half of the participants were as individuals and half were on teams. Um, we got a lot of feedback. We also engaged at the end, um, sent out a survey to get information from people to get their thoughts and feedback. But we had a lot of um, people reaching out proactively and saying, hey, this is good, or hey, this is broken, um, and so we fixed it. We also had security cookies um, on, the, on the last day. We had a, uh, we had a, a security themed gather hour that was a different week and I think I was out of the country for, but there were, uh, they screened hackers and had some, um, hackers themed, uh, cocktails at the event and I think we got Doritos. Um, we also did, uh, we also, um, so what also worked, the servers stayed up. For the most part, uh, we had about five eights, so a solid B plus um, on our availability. I am not a very good uh, sysadmin, um, so if things broke, I would just kill the DigitalOcean instance and then start a new one from scratch where I copied and pasted a bunch of scripts I had in a text file. Um, so there are better ways to do server administration. Um, that I wasn't doing them. Um, Facebook CTF is kind of flashy and fun. If you haven't seen it, it's a, it's a map of the earth and every country is a, or a map of the globe and every country is a, a target. So you, and it's very like hacker looking and black and dark and you click on a country and you go for the challenge and it's fun. Um, other thing that was successful, four individuals completed all of the challenge is including the ones thrown together. Um, which were extremely difficult, which were taken from real uh, CTFs from hacker conferences, um, which were intended for security professionals. These are um, things that would have been a challenge for some of us on the security team. Um, also, we had a Slack unfurl link. I spent a lot of time getting that to work uh, due to a misunderstanding of how HHVM worked, but it was worth it. So if you ever shared any of the fidget spinning dot life domains in Slack, would pop up with that uh, hacking person. Um, we also had some cool trophies and prizes. So this flaming trophy was for the top 10 people along with a certificate of hacking um, signed by a few of us on the security team. So in the Melbourne office, there are a couple of these, uh, which I was reminded of. I was working out of Melbourne this week. Um, so it's cool to see them. We had a couple in some other offices as well. I think Vancouver had um, two of the folks who did all of the challenges. And for um, the top 
four people. We got them all Raspberry Pi Zeros and um, a couple peripherals for those. So kind of a, a more fun, more tangible thing um, in addition to the recognition, but nothing's better than the pride and the, the personal fulfillment of being better than your coworkers at a CTF. Um, so what didn't work? There were some things about Facebook CTF that were also a little bit difficult. HHVM had some caching issues, hence me spending several hours getting a link to unfurl. Um, it was also hard to pull a list of challenges. So if you've used CTFD before, or if you've done a CTF where it starts with like, here are your 50 point challenges, here are your 100 point challenges, etc., you can go through increasing difficulty and kind of warm up and get yourself into it. And that was one of the things we wanted people to do was get warmed up and like start flexing their security muscles. Um, in Facebook CTF, it is not super easy to do that. You just kind of have to click around. So it's cool, it looks more hackery, but it's, it's not very easy to um, sort by difficulty. So also, as I said, I'm not a good sysadmin. This was the um, script to get uh, SSL set up with um, let's encrypt on all of these. And so every time something broke, I would destroy the server and then copy then paste this uh, over into a terminal and run it. And um, this was actually the best state. This was the improved state over how I was doing things. So um, that didn't totally work. There were occasional flubs in challenges um, in our haste to make new ones. So a lot of our challenges worked well. We prepared for them, we had them ready to go. Like forensics was great, that didn't have any issues. A lot of the web app ones didn't have any issues. It was the hard things that we were doing last minute. So putting together, like yanking challenges from other places and then making sure that we're actually running it in the right way or setting up the infrastructure of the server that we're using in a way that makes it vulnerable was difficult. I, um, we did a padding Oracle challenge. I kind of quickly threw that together, forgot that you can't get the first block of the cipher text um, when, you're, when you're doing that type of attack. So uh, you could only see the second half of the flag. People still got it because it was a phrase that you could Google, but um, I, I fixed it shortly after, but someone said, hey, you know that you can't get the first block, right? And I said, oh, damn and uh, had to go back and fix that. Fortunately, I think it only affected one or two people, but um, we had little hiccups like that. Um, so more preparation this time uh, helped us avoid some of that. DigitalOcean digital is probably a better way to utilize that. We did a lot of manual fixes. Um, we used PhantomJS for the XSS challenge, so that was constantly running um, a forums page, and so if your post to the forum had script in it, it would be executed. That broke every so often, um, and I don't know why. So the fix for that was if people said, hey, I don't think it's working, I would go and restart it, and then I also added a cron job to restart it, um, which isn't, uh, isn't the most scalable solution. I promise that Slack has better infrastructure than that. Um, <laughs> A lot of deleting, oops, sorry, a lot of deleting and uh, <laughs> fixing servers. Um, so some pleasant surprises. We had a higher than expected level of participation and a more diverse than expected level of participation. At least for the first few questions, a lot of people tried them. Um, and then with teams, uh, those, those were even better. People split up the work. So maybe someone non-technical was doing more of the OSINT stuff and they were learning a bit about that. And then maybe someone from ops was doing the web app challenges. Um, we got good engagement from folks. We had good discussions in our channels. Um, we also got attention from higher levels. So if you're thinking, how can I both improve security of my organization while advancing myself on a career path, um, if you can pull this off and get engagement from ICs to execs, um, that's good for your job security. I assume I haven't been fired, so. I'm going with that. Uh, some of the less pleasant surprises, we had really smart people doing it, so we ran out of challenges. Um, this is, it's good that we work with really smart people. It was just, uh, we lost a lot of, not a lot of sleep, but like an okay amount of sleep. We also lost like some productivity for the people involved. Involved Slack stayed secure, don't worry, but uh, John from our red team and myself did spend a lot of time scrambling to make these uh, backup challenges. And so some lessons learned. We solicited feedback afterwards. In addition to people talking with us um, pretty candidly, um, this was the first time we had done this or anything uh, security awareness month wise at Slack. 
Um, so some of the feedback was that SQL injection was one of the favorites. There was SSRF. There was a Python challenge where you had to get like Python execution, but you couldn't use alphabetic characters. So I think you could only use like quotes and semicolons and plus and minus or something. So it was, uh, that was fun for like the two people who got it. I think we stole that from Plaid. Uh, least favorite, XSS, Padding Oracle, not super surprising, though uh, you could break the XSS one for yourself. So if you didn't like close the script tag, then other things going into it would start getting eaten. And then so someone could break it for you, you could break it for them. We didn't do sandboxing. Um, we trusted that these domains were scoped to, uh, we did have a secret to get onto it, but it was like open to the Slack organization. So we kind of kept it within, we kept it within Slack. We didn't have any malicious activity, but it wasn't sandbox. Um, padding Oracle, we fixed, um, some positive aspects of our feedback. There was a lot of collaboration. People had fun. Um, people felt like they knew more about security afterwards, um, be it the trivia and some of the laws regarding uh, hacking or, or cybersecurity in the States, uh, or practical hands-on skills, people poking at stuff. Um, one interesting anecdote that I like is we had in a in a Slack slash command, there's like an admin page and you configure, you can configure like the name or the purpose of it. So we, we threw a flag in there. Um, one person was digging through like API logs, I think, of, of a slash, of this slash command trying to figure out where it was. And he was saying like, how do you get this? Like, I don't have access to the databases that I need to read this. And I said, oh, you can go to slash admin in your browser and go through it. And there were other people who are more Slack admins or maybe their customer experience and they're helping our customers to use Slack more effectively. So they, they knew that. So they could go find that page and then someone who's like a very highly technical person, super, super smart, love working with them, um, that didn't click. So it was, it was cool to see how the different mindsets could solve different problems. Um, and people learned from it. Areas to improve, sandboxing, more difficult challenges, but also less difficult challenges more PR and buildup was one explicit piece of feedback that we got. Um, we intend, before this CTF started, we intended to do earlier and better communication about it. I will talk a little bit about um, that in just a moment. Uh, lessons learned, have a cool domain name. Everyone loved fidgetspinning.life, tidepods.life. We didn't actually do this this time around. Tidepods are also a little dated. Um, trying to keep up on, it's hard to keep up on both security and the state of the industry and memes and which things appeal to which people. So that, uh, market better ahead of time. Uh, don't underestimate people. We ended up doing a lot of extra work because we said, yeah, you know, one RCE should be, oh, we had a buffer overflow challenge and that was our intended like max challenge. And that was done within like two days. So we uh, had to reevaluate what people knew. And we figured, oh, buffer overflow, that should be strange to people working in uh, JavaScript and PHP and not C, but there are a lot of people with a lot of different backgrounds, as I said, and so the buffer overflow wasn't terribly difficult for a lot of them. Um, and we want to incorporate more teams. Uh, teamwork helps people get better together. It gives you a bit of social aspect. It helps you meet your coworkers. Um, you have more fun than grinding alone, banging your head on a computer, wondering why you didn't get certain challenges. Um, where we also wanted to like loop in more people from Slack, work with more teams. So future work slash literally right now work, um, CTF 2.0 and Hacktober 2.0 is currently ongoing. So we actually opted for a vendor solution, um, which has several advantages of, of um, some of the things we talked about lessons learned wise. A big one was sandboxing. So everyone who's participating gets their own sandboxed instance and it gets spun up and you can take it down on your own. So it was, we didn't have to build any infrastructure this time. Um, another nice thing uh, that this offered is uh, it just had more challenges. Their challenges were already made and they ranged from OSINT to HTML comments to some easier things to SQL injection, RCE, like more complicated SQL injection. I've only poked at it a little bit, 
but it, it has a broader range of challenges and a more realistic and kind of narrative setting than we did have in the previous challenge. Um, it doesn't have some of the forensic stuff. It doesn't have some of the one-off things we did. And it doesn't have Slack-specific challenges. So we're going to, after this October, evaluate which what things worked, what didn't, how can we combine all the good things from the past um, and get rid of the bad things from the past. Um, we improved our communication as well. So I checked 30 minutes before this, and there were about 117 people who were registered. Some of those include teams. Um, registered in the CTF, and slightly less than that had at least gotten one challenge. So, and some of the challenges are as easy as like clicking on th things that you shouldn't be able to, or like going to slash something, um, trying something new. Um, the site's pretty smart, and it recognizes when you're just trying something, and so you can get a few points for that, which is it's a good start. Um, it's a lot more motivating. Um, a, on a personal note, like one of the downsides of it is you don't know how many challenges there are. You don't have a view of how many points you can actually get, where you max out. So there is a scoreboard, but it's, it's more nebulous um, how well you can actually do. Um, we've done more events for a wider audience. So I did a lock picking class a couple times this week here in Melbourne. We, the company has grown, so we had some. We have a person out in Vancouver now, so he ran lock picking out there. We had lock picking classes in Denver. Uh, lock picks were sent to New York, and we're having like a remote session for all of those people. We got these nifty little clear padlocks, so you can see the pin mechanism and the tumbler mechanism. So if you've if you've never done lock picking, it's a it's a nice and kind of low pressure way to start, and you get to start it by working with your coworkers or like in the small offices where people know each other better, like there's a lot of good participation. So that was one of the things we expanded. We did, um, we hosted some events in San Francisco with um, external speakers. So one of the events was last week, maybe this week. I don't live in San Francisco anymore, so I stopped paying attention to that schedule. Um, we got Dr. Enigma, who has an Enigma machine from the Nazis in World War II and gives presentations about that uh, around the Bay Area. So he either gave or is giving a talk about that at Slack. Um, and that's pretty accessible, too. It's, it's got like that historical pull for people. You don't really have to know cryptography to be able to appreciate um, the impact of things like that. And um, from what I've heard, he's an extremely engaging speaker. So that, I think we have a couple other external people who are going to San Francisco. Um, we've been pushing a lot towards our, our global offices as well. So. We've tried to take the things we learned from last year and from the CTF and apply them. And I would say, overall, a bit more of an improvement. Um, we've seen an uptick in participation. Oh, one of the other cool things they did, which I also missed, was a tour of the uh, SOC in the San Francisco office, so the uh, Security Operations Center. I don't actually know what that looks like. I haven't been to it in the San Francisco office, but a group of people were able to go and check it out and see more about like the physical security we're doing. So. Um, that's also really accessible. You, you don't need to know web application development to be able to appreciate how a building keeps criminals and thieves out. Um, we also have, we've been tracking different tiers and um, different prizes for trying to make sure that if someone is really good, it doesn't discourage someone who is still learning from participating. Like if you do a CTF and you get 100 points and you look at someone who has 7,000 points, it can be discouraging. So we've, we've tried to communicate better about that. And we're working towards prizes that will reward various levels of experience. And so um, with that, we're going to have a decent amount of time for Q&A. Um, I don't have more slides about what's ongoing now, and we don't have an evaluation of it yet as it ends, uh, I think, Saturday morning, Melbourne time, Friday, Friday morning, Saturday, uh, it ends Friday morning in San Francisco, um, which is after the work week here. Um, but we'll be doing more evaluations of that, what wins we had, what worked, what didn't, et cetera. Um, yeah, so with that, um, let's open it up to questions and answers. Thanks, everyone. Are you willing to put a name on the vendor? Yeah, um, it's security innovations. Um, so I had... 
I went to um, AppSec EU in, in London, and we were approached afterwards by a vendor called Avatau, um, and they're based out of Hungary. And so we started talking to them and started talking to security innovation. Um, they both had some, some pros and cons. Um, Avatau has a lot of like coding, um, so a lot of like solid technical stuff. So we were, we were very impressed by that. Um, there's a lot of, hey, this is broken first, exploit it, to code to fix it. Um, and that's super valuable for developer education. Um, for the CTF, when we wanted a bit more um, accessibility to all levels, security innovation had some easier challenges in there, um, which was basically the, the big thing for this. Um, for ongoing training, which is, is kind of a future work that we're looking at, we, uh, developer training is a mandate of some compliance frameworks. Um, right now, we just give our own content, but we don't have a ton of hands-on stuff. Both this CTF and like Avatau, and I, I think there are other vendors as well who have some hands-on security training, are things that we want to look at. So right now we have some, some one-off classes or some one-off presentations, but our, our goal is to have a little bit more of a like thriving ecosystem. So if you're on front end and you want to learn back end like security with a hacker mindset, um, that you can do that, um, that you can opt into it or that we have more frequent classes. Same for back end and learning like JavaScript front end, um, like the many ways you can do XSS, and then also opening up that up more to beyond just the engineering org. So ProdSec is very focused on engineering, the security of the product, but the security of Slack as a whole uh, comes down to everyone and not just the engineers. Any other questions? Um, you mentioned that you uh, have introduced like tiers and like prizes for the different tiers. Yes. How do you actually put people in tiers? You said that you actually found out that people have like diverse backgrounds that you don't necessarily know about them. Yeah, so our current plan is kind of hash it out once we see who has scored what. Um, so we, um, as I've been like a tiny bit disconnected because uh, I, I moved out of San Francisco last week to London, so I've been like a little bit detached. Um, I'm catching up on stuff, but I, I think our current plan is to basically let it wind down, go through the winners, and then announce the prizes afterwards and, and look at just the individuals who did it. And then if we don't personally know them and know their skill set. So a couple people from the security team have participated, for example, and they've done very well. Um, people who didn't have the answer key, so they did it on their own. They don't really need prizes. Like, you don't need a pat on the back for being good at security. That's why you got hired. So um, <laughs> the, uh, what we want to do is talk to, um, what we'll do is if we don't know the people, we'll talk to them and say, like, hey, uh, good job, or like, who was your team? Um, and it's kind of going to be a manual process for doing that. Um, ideally, in the future, we have a, a bit more um, documented and, and procedural of a process, but um, we have the benefit of it's still small enough that we can make uh, make manual decisions about the prizes. So, so last year, for example, we said, hey, there will be prizes, and then we decided on and purchased the prizes after the competition had already ended and decided how many people to reward as well. So the prizes were kind of, um, we knew we wanted to do them. We weren't sure what the engagement levels would be. So we said, OK, we'll kind of figure it out after the fact, and we'll tell everyone there are prizes, and we'll do that. Uh, but we have to kind of wing it. And so again, we're kind of winging it, but with a bit more mindfulness of um, like some of the people who won or who finished all the challenges last year, for example, are doing very well this year. And so they should still get prizes. They're not on the security team. They're, they're doing this, and they're being awesome at security in their free time. We definitely want to reward them, but we also want to see um, other people who've participated. So winging it to condense that into to one short answer. One last question. Um, how much time and man effort, you know, man hours, well, like, how much time do you actually invest in this? Um, so I'll give the answer for last year, um, where it was mostly myself and John from our red team um, with some of the other help. So coordination-wise, we were spending a couple hours a week, and during the 
one or two weeks preceding, a decent amount on making sure everything was working and setting up the infrastructure like Facebook CTF. So that wasn't full time, but I would say like quarter to half time for two weeks prior for two people. And then during was John and myself more or less full time on it. And a couple people from ProdSec did about quarter time, like helping us with the, the scrambling to make new challenges. Um, most of the challenges, uh, so like the, the incident response team, for example, didn't need to do extra work during that week because they completed their challenges ahead of time. I think that took them, uh, there were two folks who worked on that and they, I think, spent about a quarter of their time for a week, actually maybe half of their time for a week, putting it together, making the scenario and making sure it was accessible enough. Um, so all in all, um, two people full time for the week that it was running and with a little bit of, of work after the fact to evaluate um, who won and who to send prizes to, but that wasn't a ton of time and um, just mailing the prizes off. Um, this time around, was there was less time spent on running it and, the, and keeping things up because of the vendor. There was more time spent deciding on the vendor ahead of time, but it meant no, we didn't have to make any challenges. So more time was spent on evaluation of the vendor and then the non-technical aspects of it. So that was um, a couple folks have been spending the last few weeks, like at least half time, but um, event planning is just kind of time consuming. So, so even working, like we have an event planning team, but it's, it's the security people who are reaching out to like Dr. Enigma and the other speakers and seeing like, oh, can you come to Slack? Can you not? Uh, what is your schedule? Blah, blah, blah. And so that's, um, that can just be kind of a time consuming process. But um, it didn't take, like with the vendor, it took a lot less time for the CTF itself. Does that give a good idea of the, the work involved? Okay. All right, thank you, Max. Big thank you to Max. Thanks, everyone.